Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now not to be confused with Nvidia's 1000 series cards, the 100 series GPUs were OEM cards that could be found in pre-built and store-bought systems late last decade. These ranged from a 512MB G100 to a 1GB GTS 150, the most powerful in the range. These cards are often forgotten about because they weren't produced as standalone hardware, although I'm told the GTS 150 saw a very limited commercial production, and that's the card we're going to be talking about today. Based on the numbering, you may assume that the 100 series cards are worse than the likes of the GeForce 210 or 220, but nope, the 210 still holds that unfortunate title of cards from a recent era. So let's assess the specs. The GTS 150, which sounds quite cool because of the GTS at the beginning, features 128 CUDA cores, a 738MHz core clock and a gig of GDDR3. It also sounds a bit of a beast because of the two 6-pin and 450 watt PSU requirements. In 2009, when it was first used in production computers, you would have found it in pretty high-end store-bought systems. So what could you expect from such hardware? Well, like all OEM GPUs, some of the 100 series were just rebrands, some with improved thermal designs and others with different memory clocks. The GTS 150 is based on the GTS 250, which of course is what became of the 9800 GTX Plus. Based on that, the GTS 150, the best card in the 100 series lineup, should perform somewhere between the two, but it's worth remembering that they are all lacking DX11 support. So let's get into some games and see what it's capable of. First of all, we tried Battlefield 3 at 1080p res and the low in-game settings. The game averaged out at 40 frames per second and there was a little bit of stutter here and there, but nothing that affected the gameplay too much, even if this specific scene features nothing too intensive. Frame rate figures are based on an hour of gameplay across a few different level checkpoints and for the rest of the games we played each of those for an hour as well, in different scenarios. We also gave Dirt 3 a go and jumped into this single player level where, to be honest, I had no idea what I was doing, but it seemed to give our GPU a good workout with Full HD once again and the low graphical preset. We could have turned things down a little more, perhaps the resolution, and that could be said for the other games too, but because the game ran fine, at 1080p there really was no need, unless you wanted a figure closer to a constant 60 of course. Payday 2 next, a game that a lot of you requested me to test, from what I've seen of the minimum requirements, it's no surprise that this ran pretty well with 40 frames per second on average. As you can see the 1% and 0.1% lows didn't variate too much, and so there really wasn't any stutter or slowdown here, even when the action heated up and I wasn't just walking around. And finally at CSGO. I did things a little different here because CSGO tends to stutter with this card. I decided to limit the FPS to 60 and see how close the game could stick to that target. As it was a lot smoother than the game dropping from say 75 down to 55. Because of this the average was recorded as 60 with those other figures not coming in too far behind. A nice result across our tested games here. Is the GTS 150 worth it? Probably not, due to the lack of DX11 support, and the same goes for the rest of the cards in the 100 series lineup. If you found one cheap enough, should you buy it? Well, maybe, if your intentions are to build a PC for older games, or titles like CSGO, then it will perform just fine. The problem isn't with buying one of these, it's finding one. Because it was an OEM card, they're pretty scarce, but a GTS 250 or 9800 GTX Plus would give you similar performance anyway. So guys, I hope you've enjoyed today's video. Leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it. Leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And hopefully, I'll see you all in the next one.